Church. I'm Josh, the pastor here, and it's such a privilege to be with you here this morning. You know, today when we gather, we often say, you know, we give thanks for a new day, a new week, 
and we celebrate all that God gives us each day, new life, new breath. But there's an, even a bigger story that Scripture tells us. In 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, new creation is coming. The old has gone, the new is here. And so what we gather today to celebrate a new day. This is the day that the Lord has made. There's even a bigger promise that when we uh, embrace Jesus Christ, that there is new life in us, that there is an old part of us that has gone away, and a new part of us has come to life because of who Christ is. And so as we sing and pray and give God thanks this morning, I invite you to celebrate the new life that is found in Jesus Christ. And today, if you don't know Christ, today is a great day to open your heart to his life-changing love and power. So as we begin, we invite you to turn your attention to God as I open us in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you today that you are here in our midst, that you've given us not only a new day to come and worship you, but Lord, for all who have opened our hearts to you, God, you've given us new life. The old sinful ways are put behind us, and a new life in you is here in us through your Son, Jesus. Today, God, as we proclaim your goodness and love, may you unite our hearts and help us to draw near to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, as you're able today, we invite you to stand and join us as we open with some singing. Who am I that you are mindful of?
as they come, uh, we invite the congregation to turn, maybe uh, fist bump, greet someone around, just welcome them this morning, and then you may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Verses. They're called verses. 
Miss Maria likes words, so every time I come up here, you may see words because I love words. And when I don't know a word, I usually go to a friend. Marion is in the audience, and she knows I go to her. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because oh, I love words. But anyways, did you know that when you were born, you got your mommy and daddy got a birth certificate? Did you know that, right? You know what a birth certificate is? Okay, so a birth certificate is a piece of paper that mommy and daddy gets. And it has your name. You see my name? See my date of birth? I was born a little when I was born. That's okay, you know. It's okay. I'm not embarrassed. Um, so a birth certificate is a piece of paper that mommy and daddy gets. I only have maybe three minutes left. So I was, my uh, date of birth was December 25th, right? So I got that. My mom and dad got this birth certificate. So I, I, um, you get that birth certificate. Then one day when you give your heart to Jesus, guess what you get? You get another, does anybody know? You get a born again certificate. So that's the second certificate you get. And, and that certificate, you can go home and you can put your name and your date that you gave your heart to Jesus. Okay? That's very important because one day when you grow up like me and Lynn and what's your name? Josh. And Josh. <laughs> Is it Josh? Josh. Oh, J O S H. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's close to his, to Pastor. So, so like Josh and, and Lynn and, and myself, you will. Um, if kids live longer, they can. If kids want to be. To live longer, they have to be nice. Okay. That's a good point, though, Bella, because I'm going to get to that. I think I'm a few minutes out. That's a great point. You know why? I'm a, part of that great point is because when one day when you give your heart, and you all here probably give your heart already to Jesus, right? Right? Did you all do that? Make that decision with mommy and daddy? When you go home and you can put in your name and the date, let's say you did it today. Okay? Pastor Josh invited us to do that. So you put that date on here, and then one day when you look back, when you're as big as me and Josh, Josh, um, and then, right, and Pastor Josh, you look back and you'll say, oh, wait a minute, July 31st, 2022, I gave my heart to Jesus. So if your heart doesn't belong to you anymore, it belongs to Jesus. So, you do that. I would like for you guys to do that. That's very important. So, born again means when you believe in Jesus and you receive him in your heart, and he comes to do what? He comes to change your life from the inside out. You might still have your same dress. Maybe not, not from years from now, no. But you may still have your same clothes. Like, I, I have this. This is like an old outfit. But look, I love flowers. But I have this outfit, right? But you can't see the inside of me, right? You can see the old shirt I've had for like maybe 10, 20 years, not this shirt. So then your inside, people can't really see, but there's one way they can see it though, when you live your life for Jesus. So that's what we're going to do, right? So we have an old man and we have a new man. The old man is when you do things that are not pleasing to God. God doesn't like them. Like when we lie or when we steal over the arms. I learned all here. The evil spirit is controlling you. That, that is good. That's good. Maybe um, I like to talk to you about that some more. Okay? We're going to talk about that. Now, the old man is when you're angry and lie and steal and do these things. Okay? Then the new man comes. Remember, Pastor Josh said, 2 Corinthians 5.17, says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, right? In Jesus, you get your heart to Jesus. He is a new what? He is a new creature. A new man. So that means, I mean, that doesn't mean you won't make mistakes or you won't, you know, tell them. But what it means is God is changing from the inside out. And one day, you won't do those things anymore. And if you do, you'll say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I messed up. I said something I should have said. I'm sorry. And then you go, and Jesus, we did. It's a big word called regeneration. Okay, that's a little big. Maybe we can talk about it when you're a little older. But um, regeneration means something new. Make it, he's making us new. He's, he's 
wants to restore us to a relationship with him. Okay? So everyone, play, raise your hand if you get your heart to Jesus. It always to Jesus. Hey, all right. So we're going to go home and ask mommy and daddy, Mom, I want to do a born again certificate. I would love to see you put your name, the date. If you remember the date, maybe mommy or dad may remember. Okay? And then uh, we're going to have here. Okay, so anyway, I want something from Genesis. Okay, so we have a clue to the meaning of life. How many minutes have I got one? Okay. I have one minute? Okay. Do it? Okay, so in Genesis chapter 1, remember I said the big number is chapters? And the little numbers are what? Verses. Verses. So. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. <laughs> You have to come up here more often. Over my Okay, so, so in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, right? We get a clue to the meaning of life. Are you guys paying attention? Teacher's talking. I don't want to do the... Okay? So I did do it. Okay, so the clue to the meaning of life. Because God created us in what? In his... Say it, say it. Image. Yes! He created us in his image. Read the rest of that. I don't have my readers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, so we are specially made by God. Okay? So we have an in intrinsic. I know that's big for them, but I just want to intrinsic. Intrinsic value. So let's I forgot to write the name of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was supposed to just hold the mic here. I'm not sure. <laughs> you just got the quote in. Okay, so the intrinsic. Uh, I don't know. The intrinsic. Let's see then, because I'll get to it eventually. I'll get to it. Okay, so, so that's it, guys. Isn't that cool? We get a heart, we get a heart. Jesus, we thank you for giving us new life. We thank you. I thank you for these children. They're precious. 
I thank you for the day that they gave their hearts to you. You have that recording. We may not have the recording, but you do. Thank you, Father, for your gift of Jesus. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. And Lord, uh, just uh, be with these children as they grow up to love you, to honor you, and to be warriors, that you're raising up warriors. Thank you, Father. And I ask you this all. And what I say here today, let it be uh, that the meditation of my heart and the words of my lips may have been acceptable in your sight. And Lord, these precious children, you said, let the little children come unto me, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Oh Lord, thank you for these kids and those that are not here, that are outside this place. Bless them and keep them and their parents. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Donna passed away on July 29th. And so uh, please keep those who are mourning uh, in your prayers and thoughts. Uh, as Michael prays today, you're always invited and welcome to come to the altar and pray or to stay right there in your seat. Just lift up your needs as well as those of our congregation before the Lord. So Mike, can you come and lead us this morning? Father God, as we come before you this morning, we humble ourselves in your presence. We empty of ourselves out so that we can be filled with your spirit, your truth, and your love. And as we enter into your house, we're excited to experience who you are, to be radically changed. Lord, we're so thankful that it's not just a story, it's not just getting to know who you were, but it's getting to know who you are and what you can do in our lives. So Lord, this morning as we take this time in prayer, we ask that you do that work within us. Change us, shape us, mold us to be more like you. We're so thankful for the volunteers for VBS who have been changed by you and are now giving back and want others to know that same radical love that they experienced through you. Lord, this morning you know the cries of our hearts. So as we take a moment now briefly in silence, we may lift names to you, whether aloud or in our hearts. Hear us now as we express all that's on our mind. You already know, but make this a special time to lift it to you now. Thank you for always being there, like a father with open arms, welcoming his children. Thank you for always listening and loving us and teaching us how to be agents of that love and agents of that change in a world so desperate and hungry for you. Let it start here with us. Thank you for all that you continue to do, not only within our lives, but in the life of this church. Continue to use us and light the way forward. In your wonderful name, we gather this morning and we pray. Amen. And now uh, we're going to share a hymn, Come Thou Fountain of Every Blessing. And it's a hymn in which we ask God to help keep our hearts aligned with Him along life's journey. So uh, it's number 400 in your hymnal there in your pew. And as you're able, I invite you to stand and join us as we unite our hearts and voices together.
today is from the book of Colossians. It is chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I invite you today to hear the word of the Lord. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, for Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. And now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Today, God, we come before you and pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word to our hearts and minds. We thank you for your word. It gives us truth that encourages us and challenges us, God. Today, Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, today, uh, as we for our series of Domino Effect, I want to begin with a question. And the question is, who are you wearing? Now, it's like an odd question, so we unpack that a little bit. If you've ever seen uh, an awards show, maybe the Academy Awards, the Oscars, the Grammy Awards, there's often a red carpet. And on the red carpet, where all the celebrities come down, getting, going into the new, getting into the facility where they're going to have the awards show, there's media there, and they're taking pictures, they're saying, who are you wearing tonight? And they want to know what design they're wearing, whether it be Prada, or Vera Wang, or, or someone else. And it's this whole big to-do, and sometimes there's actual shows talking about the clothes people are wearing. And now, I'm not here to ask you if you're wearing Gap, or a brand from Target, or Ralph Lauren, or whatever it might be. But there's a metaphor here, that what Paul's talking about in Colossians, He's asking us, are we wearing the old life that was lost in sin, or are we wearing the new life that is found in Jesus Christ? And so today, perhaps as we talk about this, we can picture ourselves walking down our own red carpet. And Paul is asking you and asking me, who are we wearing? Is it the old life, or is it the new life? Because in our series today, Domino Effect, we've been looking at each week something that the Apostle Paul has unpacked for us in his letter to the Colossian church. And each week as we embrace what the scripture is teaching, and as the Holy Spirit works in our life, it has this potential to cause this domino effect where life change continues to happen in us. And today our fourth domino is the power of Jesus Christ in our life. We've talked about the power of Christ in us, now we're going to unpack what that power looks like in this uh, session today. So, there's a transition taking place in chapter 3. Uh, in verses 1 through 4, Paul is wrapping up what he has been basically teaching in the first few chapters. He's wrapping up really a doctrinal section. He's been talking about the truth of who Jesus is and his supremacy. He's been talking about kind of big picture theology to combat the false teachings and the false narratives that were going on around the Colossian church. But by verse 5, he begins to, to turn his attention to the nitty-gritty of life, to real-world issues, and how the doctrine, how we believe, begins to impact, or should begin to impact, how we live day in and day out. And so we begin to see this transition. He begins this section with uh, this heading that he's talking about a change of status or a change of identity in the first four verses. So, if you've ever been on a plane, this hasn't happened to me, I've heard others talk about this, but you've, you have a coach ticket, and you're waiting in line, and then you get upgraded, you get a status change to first class, and all of a sudden, your whole vision of the flight changes. Now you're not going to be sitting like this. Now you're not going to have to figure out how to get enough leg room. Now you're going to be in a nice, wide seat, plenty of leg room, more food, all kinds of things. I'm sure there's all kinds of mysteries that occur up there that us common folk never ever get to hear about. But you're, there's a status change. And Paul is saying, 
saying that when uh, with Christ, that when we have embraced Christ, there is a status change in us. There is an identity change. And this is really important that we see how Paul is unpacking this. Is he's going to talk, and maybe you've heard that in the scripture reading. He's going to talk about how we live and what we do. And if we begin to go to that point before understanding our identity in Christ, what we embrace is more an idea of moralism over a Christian teaching. And there's a difference. Now, I'm not against being good moral people. I think as Christians, we should eventually be living out good morality, have good morals. But if we are just trying to be good moral people and think that that is Christianity, then we are missing the boat. There's a difference. The teaching of the scriptures is that we are dead people spiritually. And that Christ came to bring us life, to bring us from a place of spiritual death to a place of spiritual life. And so it starts with a status change. It starts with an identity change in us. And if we try to earn our way into being just a good, a nice person, a good moral person, it becomes a works righteousness perspective. That there's a way we can earn this. There's a way we can do this. And we can't earn God's approval. We can't earn our way uh, in God's favor. God shares it freely through His grace, and we can only be saved through God's grace, through Christ. And so Paul here is reminding folks, and this is what he says, you have been raised with Christ. You died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. So he's pointing to the reality. They have a new identity. And he's using language that really seems like he's referring to their baptism. That when they were baptized, the picture of them going under the water and coming up uh, is this idea that their old life is now dead. And they're now being raised. They are brought up so that they are now experiencing a new life in Jesus Christ. And so there's an identity change. And today I want to invite us to think about that. That as Paul is unpacking this, that understanding who we are in Jesus is essential to living the new life in Christ. Because it reminds us that we have the ability through Christ to actually live a new life. I, uh, there was in 1972, the Duke of Windsor, who was the uncrowned king of England, Edward VIII, some of you follow, I know some people, there's kind of a, a cult following of like British royalty stuff, some of you may wake up in the middle of the night to watch, you know, a, a royal wedding, or to watch all the news around that, okay, there's, there's a following of that, there's some new shows that have come out in recent years about, you know, the, the history of the royalty, but there was, the Duke of Windsor advocated his throne at one point, he left the throne to marry a commoner, and he died in 1972. And when he died, there was all kinds of film footage, maybe kind of a retrospective of his life. And in one of the interviews that he did, he talked about his childhood growing up as the Prince of Wales. And he discussed how his dad, the king, tried to form him and tried to make sure he was walking the right path. And this is one of the things he says about his dad. He says, sometimes when I had done something wrong, he would admonish me saying, my dear boy, you must always remember who you are. Isn't that interesting? As the king is trying to help his son live into his role, his future role as king, and obviously try to help his behavior go in the right direction, one of the points he was making is reminding him of his identity. It's reminding him that he is royalty. And that in that identity, as he lives that out, that has implications on his actions. And friends, the good news here today is you don't need to be a member of a British royal family to be a member of royalty. Is that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the one that we said that we want is the, the supreme ruler of all. When you come to him and receive him as your savior, you are adopted into his royal family. You are a son and daughter of the king. That is your new identity. And so we live our life out of that. We don't earn our way into it. We, we're not good enough, nice enough, a, a polite enough person to, to find our way into that. But because what, of what Jesus does in us, he brings a new status, a new identity. Now we begin to live our life in a new way. And that's where Paul's discussion goes from here. He says a new life, these new wardrobe, right? When you're starting a new life, 
you can get a new, get a new wardrobe. And that's what Paul's going to go into in verses 5 through 9 and ultimately in verses 10 through 12. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. He lists a whole bunch of things. And so he talks about putting behind them their old ways of life, putting them to death. And then in verses 10 through 12, he says, put on the new self. Put on the new life. Now, one of the things that we've seen, we don't know exactly what Paul was thinking, but one of the things that it seems like he keeps tapping into is baptismal language. And in the early church, when you were baptized, often what would happen is you would wear a pair of maybe your old clothes up to the baptistry. And then you would take those off and you would be baptized. And as you came out of the water, you were given a new robe to put on. And it was the symbol that you were putting on a new life as a follower of Jesus from that point on. And as Paul is saying this, he shared this language in Colossians in his letter. It seemed as though Paul was reminding them of this. That when they came to Christ, they had old clothes. Old, an old life. that was living in the way of sin. But now in Christ, they have been raised with Christ. They're experiencing Christ's resurrection life in them. And they're now to put on a new life. Put on a new way of living. Because their identity is changed. Their God is doing something in them that is transforming them from the inside out. Now it's kind of like this tension. If you were to buy, go out and buy a new suit, a new dress, some new clothes, and you were to put those on, you wouldn't combine them with old clothes, right? You wouldn't wear a new suit or a new dress with a pair of really dirty jeans. They don't go together. It doesn't fit. And Paul's saying to us, we can't try and put on the new life in Christ and be holding on to that old sinful way as well. It doesn't go together in the same way that old clothes and new clothes don't go together. When we moved, we went through a whole lot of old clothes. Some that apparently had shrunk a lot in recent years. Because <laughs> that's the only conceivable answer and explanation why they didn't fit anymore. And others that were just maybe worn out, they, they, they weren't where we were in life. And so we got rid of them, we gave them away, we donated them, and some are just ready for to go home to glory, wherever the clothes go. <laughs> and then there were new clothes we got, and we realized that as we're entering a new phase, a new size perhaps, there's something, there's new things that fit us. And the scripture is reminding us of here, is there is an old way of life. It's not supposed to fit us anymore. That Christ has brought us out of that. And that he's inviting us to put on something that is new, that is, uh, can only be found in him. And what ties this all together is the idea and the power of what Christ does in us. You see, sometimes we, don't, we, we kind of focus solely on how Christ forgives us. We talked about that in one of our weeks. One of our dominoes was that Christ reconciles us with our Heavenly Father. He brings us back together with him. That, that uh, chasm where our relationship with God was fractured has been forgiven because of Jesus when we receive his gift in our lives. And that's absolutely very good news. But I want to invite you to think about it like this, maybe a little bit differently. If all Jesus did was forgive us, that certainly would be enough. But if our identity, if what's in our heart doesn't change, if our sinful heart doesn't begin to re experience uh, regeneration, as Maria said, or, or God's grace touching us, then we're prone to go right back out and keep doing the same things that we've done over and over again. Now, Christ will, will, will forgive us, right? But His power is not just limited to forgive us. His power is also to help us be transformed by His grace. So that we sin less. So that we continue to live a new life. And he talks about this, Paul talks about this here in uh, verse 10. He says, And I put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. I mentioned this one of the previous weeks, that when Christ comes in, we invite Christ to come into our life and receive him. He begins to refashion our hearts. The image of God is imprinted on all of us. That is, that is marred by sin and its effects. It's still there, but it's marred. 
the Holy Spirit, when we receive Christ, comes in and he begins to do a cleanup job. He begins to, to begin to iron those things out and make them new. So that we are, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, a new creation. That we are not just someone who is forgiven and we're the same old self, but that we have a new identity. There is a status change and we have a new life in Christ. And that, yes, there are times we will fall. There are times where we need to confess sin again. But here's a very important statement. I invite you, if you remember nothing else, to remember this today. Uh, it's a statement I heard one of my professors say in seminary. And it says this, sin may remain, but it no longer reigns. Sin may remain, but it no longer reigns. We all know that until the, the day we die, we're going to have a battle with making the right choices and, and putting on a new life in Christ. But before Christ, sin reigned in our heart and life. It was the, basically what ruled us. But after Christ, God has broken that reign on our hearts. Now the challenge is, do we cooperate with what Christ wants to do in us? Let me give you this analogy about that. Path. Some of you may have seen on TV uh, home remodeling shows. There's, all, there's entire networks about these things, right? There's not a dozen. And essentially the theme goes like this. Someone buys an, an old fixture up or maybe something like this, and they have a vision that they're gonna redo it. And there's often two home buyers that they, they put the money down maybe, or they, they're part of the process, but there's a team of people who's gonna do the project. So they take them around and say, we can fix this house up, do you want this house? Sure. So they begin demoing. They go in, take up the floors, take down some walls. Now. One of the things that always astounds me about this is you have these individuals, these designers, these construction crews, who are extremely gifted. I mean, they've got a TV show about it. You've seen the work. And they come in and they say, you know what? We're going to take down this wall, and it's going to really open the space up. And sometimes you'll see the person whose house this is going to be say, oh, you can't do that. It's going to look horrible. And they fight them tooth and nail on some of the project decisions. And I'm sitting there saying, you got one of the best designers in the world. Just go with them on this. Just trust them on this. But here's the picture. In the end, it, it often turns out to be a beautiful thing. It, I've never watched one and thought, well, you know what? The previous work was much better. I shouldn't have touched that place. And here's the picture of how God works in our life with the Holy Spirit. See, when, when we're bought by the blood of Jesus, when Jesus uh, comes to us, invites us to know, and we respond by receiving his grace, he comes in. But you know, like any of the remodeling show, he doesn't say, you know what? You're mine. I'm going to leave you just as you are. You know, you're, you're good. No, there's renovation work to be done. And there are times when the Holy Spirit comes to us and says, you know what? I've got to take it. I've got to be honest with you. That wall got to go. That habit got to go. That thing you've been messing with, playing with a little bit, being tempted with, going a little too far with, that got to go. And there are times where it's hard. There are times where we want to say, Lord, no, we're keeping that wall up. We're not going to put that down. It's fine. It's okay. And we are arguing with the creator of the universe, with the one who knows exactly who we are, who loves us, who paid for our sins through his blood, and his goal is not to harm us, but to free us to live a life abundantly in him. And yet we all do it, don't we? Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. And yet his goal is to do this. His goal is always, in the end, that his renovation work in our hearts and lives is to make us more like him, to make us more loving and more fruitful in our life more patient, more kind, so that when we go into our workplaces and schools and to uh, shop right, and even on the New Jersey Turnpike or the AC Expressway during beach season, that we have the fruit of God in us. We extend love and grace, and we have the fragrance of Jesus coming out of us. And that people see that they're different in a good way. It's more than just being forgiven. And we are grateful for God's forgiveness. But he has come and do so much more in us. And the challenge is this. The Spirit will do the heavy lifting. But we've got to cooperate. And I want to invite you to hear Paul's words here. His words, as he's writing this, are not passive words. 
are not just sit by, do whatever, and just let the, and watch the Spirit work. The Spirit will work. Listen to what he says. Set your minds on things above. Put to death the things of the sinful nature. Put on the new self. In essence, he's saying we have a part to play. We've got to cooperate. When he says, I'm taking out this wall, Lord, I don't see it. I don't understand it, but I trust you. Go ahead. When he's saying, I want to invite you to trust me in a new way. It's going to cause you to take a step of faith. It's going to be hard, but trust me, I'm going to meet you there. We say, okay, Lord, that's part of me putting on a new life. I'm going to trust you. You see, we're not going to be able to change ourselves from the inside out. We're not going to be able to make things that only God can do happen. But he is going to invite us to join him on this journey. And if we will cooperate with his work, he's going to do the work of renovation of our hearts and our lives. So that more and more each day, we look more and more like him. And that is our goal. And so here's the challenge this morning. Put on the new life in Christ by cooperating with God's work in our lives. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in this. Let's, let's pray. Lord, today we thank you that you are a good, loving God. That when you come to us, Jesus, and say, there, we've got to let go of something. We got to put away an old sinful habit that's more of our old life than it is with our new life. And when you come to us and invite us to take a step of faith, God, it's part of putting on that new life, and we don't see how it's going to turn out. The Lord, you are one who loves us, and it can be trusted. Show us today, God, where we can cooperate with you, where we can. Uh, allow your spirit to work more and more in us. If we've been resisting you, God, help today be the day we say, Lord, have your way. Lord, do your will. And God, as we continue to walk this walk of faith through life, on those days when we do fall, when we do make the wrong choice, would you remind us of your grace and love? As we confess our sin to you, Jesus, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Put us back on the path, becoming more like you. We thank you for this all, and it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we conclude today, we're going to close with a uh, song of worship, and we ask you to, to stand and join us with your hearts and voices together.
ways to go. Uh, if you've never embraced the good news of Jesus, if you've never made Christ the Savior of your life, if you didn't realize you were even invited into that, know that you are. And I would love to talk with you and pray with you. Just uh, pull me aside, and I would be happy to make this today the day in which you come home to Jesus. And now as we go, may we go in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who not only gives us a new day, but new life in Him. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.